is going to be Mr. Sidart, right? Yes. And then the second one will be Mr. Paul Kratoska? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, good evening um, and also good morning. My name is Firman Lung and I would like to thank you all uh, again for joining us on day four of the workshop on academic writing for international publication presented by American Institute for Indonesian Studies or IFIS along with National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. Um, and for today, uh, this is gonna be a very interesting session. The first session will be led by Dr. Siddharth Chandra who will talk about several topics such as what reviewers look for, um, responding to referees report and also choosing the right journal. Whereas the second session, which will be led by Dr. Paul Kratoska, he will discuss about why your dissertation is not a book. And allow me to briefly introduce the uh, facilitators for this workshop again. So our first speaker, Dr. Sira Chandra is president of American Institute for Indonesian Studies, IFIS, and also the director of the Asian Studies Center and also the professor of economics in James Madison College at Michigan State University. And then our second, uh, presenter, which will be Dr. Paul Kratoska, is publishing um, director of NUS Press at the National University of Singapore. Um, and before I give the floor to the facilitators, allow me to remind you all um, to please use the Q&A function to write questions. Please mention your name and your institutional affiliation. And please do not ask questions using the raise hands function as the participant speakers are currently being turned off on purpose during the webinar. Ya, jadi bagi para peserta, mohon menggunakan fungsi Q&A untuk menulis pertanyaan Anda. Jangan lupa cantumkan nama dan juga asal institusi, karena semua partisipan uh, selama webinar ini akan di-mute, jadi kami tidak bisa menerima questions bila Anda tidak menggunakan uh, fungsi Q&A ya. Jadi jangan menggunakan uh, fungsi raise hands. All right then, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker for today. I would like to welcome Mr. Sidar Chandra to begin his presentation. Mr. Sidar, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Firman Lung. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good evening to those in Indonesia. Salamat sore. And good morning to those in the US. And if you're in some other time zone, good whatever time of day it is. Um, so um, let me start off my presentation. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today, um, so Obviously, this is part of our larger workshop on academic writing for international publication. Uh, and thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Firman Lung. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, really three things. The first is what do reviewers look for in research papers? When you, when you submit your paper to a journal for publication, uh, oops, there's a message in the box, just a moment. Can anybody tell me what that message is? Or uh, I thought I saw a message in the chat box. Let's see. Is everything okay? Is everybody able to see? Yeah, it's just a good yes. evening greeting. All right. No worries, Mr. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, okay. So uh, today's presentation, we're gonna look at three questions. I'm gonna try to do it in the short span of less than an hour. Uh, what do reviewers look for in research papers? When you submit your paper to a journal, it is pro if it's a good journal, it's gonna be reviewed by a few people. They're gonna be academics like you. They may be a little more experienced than you. They will probably have expertise in the subject in at least one of the subjects relating to your paper. The second thing I'm gonna look at is, the second point is gonna be responding to referee reports. So those referees will write reports, turn them back into the editor of the journal, uh, maybe make a recommendation about whether to publish or to revise or to reject the paper, and you will end up getting those referee reports. If you are given a chance to revise your paper, then what are some uh, good ways in which you can respond to the referee reports? Third, I'll talk a little bit about choosing the right journal. Um, I think Dr. Kratoska has talked about this already on Monday. I'm going to give you the perspective of a faculty member just like you, so like everybody in this room today, I'm trying to get my work published. I've been trying to do it for the last over 20 years. I'll give you my perspective on how, at least how I choose journals um, to which to send my paper. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. All right. So um, first, what do reviewers look for? Now keep in mind, 
uh, and this is something you saw on day one of this workshop, right? One of the first questions an editor is going to ask when he or she receives your paper is who is going to read this paper, right? Editors want readers. And so in order to get published, what you as an author need to do is you need to write for a specific audience, somebody uh, you need to have in mind who are the people who are going to read your paper. You need to pick journals or publishers that serve that audience, right? So if you write on a particular subject, on a particular discipline, let's say, you're not going to send your article to a journal in another discipline, right? Because the readers of that other journal are probably not going to be interested in your paper. So keep your audience in mind, pick a journal or publisher that serves that audience. And if possible, try to write your paper so that it not only reaches that relatively small audience, but a larger audience, okay? So if your paper has broad enough implications that it goes beyond the immediate audience, that's a bonus as well. And your editor is likely to look favorably at that paper, okay? So for example, if you're writing a paper on pandemics in Indonesia, yes, your paper may be interesting to people who study health and pandemics, but maybe if you add a historical component to it and talk about the 1918 influenza pandemic as well, you'll catch a few people who are interested in history, okay? So that's the kind of, of, um, of um, that's really the point I wanna make with the, with the bottom item there, if possible interest a wider audience. Okay, so now let's come to, given this background, what do journal reviewers look for, right? When your paper goes into a journal, the editor is gonna send it to a reviewer and the editor is gonna ask the reviewer to tell them, the editor, what they think of the paper. And in some way, shape or form, they're going to ask the reviewer to look for at least three things. Number one is going to be significance. The significance of your paper. And what that means is, number one, is the topic important? Okay, is this something that a lot of people will read, right? If it's an important topic, then a lot of people are going to want to read your paper. So the subtext of that first question is, Will many people want to read this paper if I publish it in my journal? Okay. Now, um, a second thing that's very important is does the paper advance the state of knowledge? So often when I receive a paper from a journal, the editor will explicitly ask me, how does this paper advance what we already know? Okay. And the subtext of that question is, if somebody does read it, if the topic is important and somebody reads it, are they going to go away saying, you know, I really got something out of this paper. I learned something new. And therefore, the next time this journal comes out, I'm going to look and see what it publishes because maybe the next few papers will also contain something that I learned from. Okay. So these are really uh, in the area of significance. These are the two probably most important things that a reviewer is going to look for in your paper when they're writing a referee report. Okay. A second thing, so this is number two. A second thing that reviewers will look for is innovation. And by innovation, what I mean is what is new, okay? What is it that your paper is doing that hasn't been done before? And there are a variety of ways in which you can do something new, okay? Broadly speaking, there are two areas in which you can make innovations. Number one is in the topic itself, okay? So let's say that you're studying pandemics and you've discovered that, you know, women died in larger numbers than men during a particular pandemic, okay? And nobody knew that before, okay? So that is an example of a substantive or a topical innovation. You have discovered something new about the subject and you are conveying it to the readers. A second type of innovation that I think is also important, depending on the kind of journal you submit your paper to, is a methodological innovation, okay? So that is where people have analyzed some data using a particular method. So I do a lot of quantitative analysis. I do a lot of statistical research. They've used a particular statistical method. I figured out that, you know, there are some problems with that method. Here is a better method to analyze the same statistical data. And when we do it, maybe the results are different, or maybe there's something new that we didn't see that we can now see. That is an example of a methodological innovation, okay? So one of the things you need to convey to the reader and to the reviewer is that you are doing something new. You are being innovative in your paper, 
Okay. Ideally, if you can do both, then you have an even stronger case to make that your paper is innovative. Okay. Third, and this is very important. This is probably the area in which most papers that are not going to get published, that are going to get rejected. This is probably the area in which they're most likely to fail. Okay. And that is the approach. And by approach, what I mean is, does the paper use robust methods to answer the central questions? Okay, so number one, are you using a method that is appropriate to take you from your question, okay, to look at whatever data material you have and to come up with your conclusion, okay? Now, these methods can be qualitative. They can be quantitative. It doesn't matter. It's whatever, your, whatever you learned in your discipline, okay? But there are certain recognized ways of analyzing material and you need to use methods that people will look at and say yeah this is a recognized way people have maybe used it before okay you're innovating a little bit but this is a recognized way to get from your question your starting point to your conclusion um, and then the second part of the approach is okay you made a claim you're trying to get to a conclusion you need some material in the middle you need some data and by data, I don't necessarily only mean numbers. Of course, it can mean numbers. It can be qualitative material, okay? But the question here is, are the data that you are using appropriate for answering the central question, okay? So if, for example, I want to study how many people died during the 1918 influenza pandemic in Indonesia, I should have some statistics on numbers of people, maybe on people who got ill, maybe on mortality, people who died. Okay, those are the kinds of data I'm going to be looking for. So make sure your data are appropriate for answering the central questions of your paper. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about tips for a positive review process now. Okay, your reviewer has been given these instructions. They're looking for significance, they're looking for innovation, they're making sure your approach is good and robust. And now they've written a referee report, they've critiqued your paper. Um, and the referee report has come back to you, okay? Um, now, um, the most common results of the review process are rejection and revision, okay? It is extremely rare for a paper to be accepted outright in a good journal. You saw this in Dr. Krotoska's presentation on Monday. The American, I think it was the American Political Science Review, 0% of the papers that were submitted were accepted without revision, right? They all went back for revision, they were revised, they were resubmitted, and then they started getting accepted, okay? So this is a common situation that you're gonna find yourself in. And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is give you a little bit of an idea based on my experience about how you can make the, the review process a positive one. Okay, so number one tip, make it easy, all right? When you write your paper, make it easy. When you get your paper back with the referee, when you get your referee reports back, whatever you do, make it easy. Here's what I mean by make it easy, okay? Reviewers are very busy people, just like you. They are probably researchers. They may have teaching responsibilities. They may have administrative responsibilities. They probably have families back home, maybe. They have a commute to work, all of that, okay? So they are tired at the end of the day, just like everybody else, all right? And so a lot of reviewers will have a very strict time budget for review, okay? When I get a request to review papers uh, for a journal, I always think, okay, I have to set aside X hours. When am I gonna find those hours? And I'm gonna mark it in my calendar, okay? So they have a time budget for their reviewers. And what this means is, you need to make it easy for them to answer those three questions, okay? You need to make it easy for a reviewer to find in your paper what he or she is looking for in order to make a determination about whether your paper is significant, whether it is innovative, and whether you used the proper approaches to get from your questions to your answers, all right? Make it easy for them to find it. And what this means is the presentation of your paper has to be excellent. Now, note, I'm not saying good. I'm not saying very good. Make it excellent. You want to make this experience as pleasurable, as happy an experience for the reviewer as you possibly can, okay? 
or to put it another way you need to make this experience as painless as possible for your reviewer okay so what does this mean no typographic errors all right go back do a spell check do a grammar check if you feel like you're not in perfect command of english hire somebody who knows english to look at your paper pay them for an hour or two or whatever and say please read this please help me fix the grammar okay and the spellings and the typos um by the way i should mention here that i know a lot of faculty in the us for whom english is their first language they still hire an editor to look at their paper and to clean it up before they submit it to a journal okay so you don't necessarily have to have english as your second language to engage in this practice this is a very common practice okay no typographic errors perfect grammar and spelling good is not good enough whatever dr nerney told you yesterday take it to heart you need to do it okay you need to convey to the reader that you are in command of english or that at least your paper conveys that uh, whatever has been done has been done with perfect or with very very good expression your formatting should be tidy and attractive okay make it look nice um it can't hurt you it can only help now one thing that can happen if you do not do these three things if you have typographic errors if you have you know grammar and spelling errors if you have formatting that's kind of untidy one of the things that can happen is your reviewer can stop looking to see where the significance innovation and approach are in your paper they may just start correcting your paper they may become your copy editor okay on a number of occasions i have received a paper i've been asked to review it for its content it is it has so many errors and problems in it that i just start marking it up for spelling mistakes and then my referee report at the end of it focuses on cleaning up the paper and i really don't have much that is positive to say about the significance innovation and approach because the author did not let me get to it they did not let me find it they distracted me with all these other problems with the paper okay so the problem is i can become or a reviewer can become your copy editor which you do not want to happen it will distract the reviewer from the main points of your research and worst of all it will waste the reviewer's time okay uh, and this is the this is this is the the most sort of this is the out, outcome that you want to avoid the most right so make sure that your paper is is really top quality when you submit it okay so make it easy for the reviewer second make it interesting all right the reviewer is a human being just like you all right they want to they want to do things that are interesting they want to do things that are fun they don't want to be reading a paper that's really boring and you know wow i've read 100 papers like this and at some point you space out you start thinking about something else even though you have the paper in front of you okay so you want to convince the reviewer that your paper is interesting and innovative all right and this is where the abstract and introduction of your paper are very very important okay usually the abstract and the introduction will be the first thing that the reviewer will read in fact when a journal sends me a paper saying hey we want you to review this in order to make a decision so, because i get to choose i can say no i don't want to review this paper i look at the abstract and i say you know is this a paper that i will learn something from if i read it and if the answer is yes i will review the paper but if it looks like it's going to be a boring paper or there's nothing interesting here i'm just going to tell the the journal editor i'm sorry i don't have time okay so you want to make sure that you engage somebody the moment they read your abstract and your introduction that they say wow i want to read this whole paper because i think i'm going to learn something new here right there's a saying in english you probably heard it in some form the first impression is the last impression okay your chance to make an impression lies in your abstract make sure you make that impression okay the next most important part of your paper probably is the conclusion okay when i review a paper i start with the abstract and the introduction the abstract tells me what's going to happen in the paper from the beginning to the end in a few lines the introduction tells me why it's important why it's significant okay the conclusion tells me where you arrived or where you think you arrived in terms of your destination okay and the reason i read it is the introduction and then the conclusion 
then I know when I start reading the rest of the manuscript, I have an idea about what I'm looking for. I have an idea about the direction in which you're going. And I can assess whether you are doing the right things that you need to do in order to get to your destination. Okay, so I, I read the introduction typically for the significance. I read the abstract and sometimes the introduction for the innovation. I read the conclusion because that allows me to figure out whether you use the right approach when I'm reading the whole paper, whether you use the right approach to get to your conclusion. And I hope you can appreciate now that when I review a paper in this manner, I have been able to discover significance, innovation, and approach. I'm able to write a referee report that addresses these three important points, okay? So keep in mind when you write a paper, how are you gonna structure the paper so that you can easily get your reviewer, first of all, interested, and then easily get them to find significance, innovation, and approach in your paper. All right. Um, there's another very important part of the paper that I always look at, and that is the references or the citations at the end of your paper or in footnotes, okay? Why do I do that? Because I wanna get an idea about whether you know the literature that your paper is engaging, okay? Remember, when you write a research paper, you are expressing your thoughts, but you are also having a conversation. You are having a conversation with other people who express thoughts that are related to what you are writing about, okay? So when you write a paper, if you make references to work, other work in the subject, you are beginning to have that conversation with people who have already expressed their thoughts about the subject, okay? And what it tells me is that you know about the work that has been done in the area, right? So can I really trust that the work that you're doing is new? Well, if you cited a lot of other work in the area, you probably know what has been done. You probably have a good idea about what hasn't been done and what needs to be done and where you can place your paper within these gaps in the literature, okay? So um, for references, um, show what you know and show that you know. This is your opportunity to do those two things, okay? You wanna convey to your reviewer that you know your material. All right. Um, and um, generally speaking, if the journal does not limit the number of references, more references is usually better than fewer references, okay? If you submit a paper to, let's say, an economics journal, and you have only 10 references at the end, unless there's a limit and you're writing a very short paper, um, that really is not gonna cut it. It's probably not gonna fly, okay? Your reviewer is gonna look at it and say, you've only got 10 citations, there are probably 25 other things that you should have cited that you didn't. I don't know whether you did not cite them because you don't know about them or whether you just felt they were not important. But either way, I think it's a problem. It makes it harder for me to gauge whether you know your discipline, whether you know your field. Okay, the second um, topic that I'd like to cover is responding to referee reports. So what is the purpose of a referee report? Um, it has multiple purposes. The first is to advise the editor about whether he or she should publish your paper. The second is to give you feedback to improve your paper. And this is very, very important because even if your paper is rejected, you will get feedback to improve your paper. The third sometimes is to engage in an academic exchange, all right? So sometimes, the reviewer who's probably an expert in the field will want to engage you in a conversation and say, you know what? I thought this, but you were saying that. What's really going on here? Can you explain this a little bit more? Okay. Now, based on the referee report, the referee will make recommendations. The, the possible recommendations, and you heard some of this on day one of this workshop, are accept. This is rare on the first attempt. It is extremely rare for the top journals. The second possibility is revise and resubmit. The third is reject, which is very common in the best journals because they publish typically 10% or fewer of the articles that they receive. Different journals have different categories. There may be other categories that are somewhere in between. So for example, there are journals that do reject and resubmit, which is different from a revise and resubmit, okay? 
Um, but these are basically the three, the three categories of recommendations. All right. So now you've got a referee report. And you're thinking, and the, and the editor of the journal said, you know, we want you to revise your paper. Here are some referee reports, okay? Please uh, clean up your paper based on the referee reports, respond to the referee reports, and send back your paper, okay? The first thing I want to say is different scholars have different approaches to addressing a referee report, okay? And I'm going to give you my approach based on my 20 plus years of experience. So, the first thing when I receive a referee, referee report is I make this assumption that the referee is trying to help, okay? Even if the review of the paper is very critical, sometimes to the point of being mean, okay? Um, at the end of the day, my assumption is the referee is trying to help me clean up my research, okay? And that's really great. I'm getting an expert to help me make my research better. So what I do based on that assumption is I look for feedback in the referee report that will help me improve my paper, okay? So what is the referee saying that I can do to make my paper, my argument, a stronger argument the next time I submit it, whether it's as a revision to the existing journal or as a new submission to some other journal because they rejected the paper, okay? Um, I typically, I read the referee report at least twice, and then I spend a little bit of time thinking about the comments. I don't do anything for a day or two. I just let those the referee report kind of slosh around in my head. Okay. Um, then I start responding to the referee report a couple of days later. And the way I do it is I create a document. I take the comments of the referee and I paste them in a new Microsoft Word document. Okay. Next, I identify the comments to which I need to respond. So some of the comments may be, you know, this is great. Well done. Okay, and in that case, you really don't need to say, well, you can say thank you. That's, you know, very nice of you to say that, okay? Um, so I try to respond to every comment that the referee makes. You want to make sure that you show the referee that you appreciate that they have taken the time to read your paper, even though they're very busy and may have wanted to do something else, okay? And one way to show that is to respond to every single comment that they make, okay? Even if it's with a very short one or two words respond, show them that you value their input, okay? Below each comment, I enter a response. I usually mark it with a little arrow symbol. So for example, uh, the comment may say, change the word on this page, this line, change the word minus to plus, you got it wrong, okay? And I look at it and I say, oops, I made a mistake there. So what do I do? I change the word minus to plus. And in my response to the referee, I say, changed, thank you. All right, they helped me, I did the change. My paper is probably better, thank you very much, okay? And then you go into the manuscript and you edit the manuscript to reflect that response that you made. All right, so responding to a referee report, some basic principles, take every comment seriously, regardless of the decision, be grateful. A busy expert has taken the time to help you by giving you free feedback, okay? You got this for free. Respond politely, it never hurts, okay? Um, thank you, good point. Uh, even if you wanna oppose the referee, do it nicely, it doesn't hurt, okay? While I see your point, I'm unable to make the change because the data are not available, all right? And you can even add to that, this is a limitation of the paper of my study, and in the limitation section of my study, I have now mentioned this, all right? You can do these things, you're free to do it, do it. You're free to be nice, be nice. Okay, so here's an example. I'm taking my own example because I actually got permission from this journal to share referee reports. Um, this is a paper that I published in a journal on, it's a demography journal, it's called Population Studies. The title of the paper was Mortality from the Influenza Pandemic of 1918-1919 in Indonesia. Um, I wonder if I can paste uh, the URL in the chat box, whoops. Uh, I'll do it later on, okay? But here's what happened. I submitted the paper. The original referee report was six pages long, okay? Four referees reviewed the paper. I got six pages of reviews. When I replied to the referees, my response was actually 15 pages long, okay? So I had responded to pretty much every comment and my, my response was actually 15 pages, okay? 
What followed was a reply from the journal that was one page long. And it basically said, you've addressed pretty much everything the referees had to say. Here are two or three very minor things. Clean them up and we'll publish your paper. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to show you these documents one by one. I'm going to stop the share. Um, and we'll go to Microsoft Word. Let's see. Actually, maybe we'll go to Adobe. Let's go to Adobe. Just a moment. So yeah, let, let me share this. So um, these are the referee reports. Can you see my screen, everybody? And it, is it big yes. enough? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so look, this is a six page document and this is only three out of the four referee reports. The other one was submitted in a different format, so I'm not showing it to you. But here's the referee report. This is what it looks like. Um, and if you look at the comments, some of them are pretty major comments, right? The section, this section, the literature review lacks a general introduction. You're not telling me about this pandemic. When did it start? When did it occur? Were there multiple waves? How many were believed to be infected? Did the exposure to the first wave protect people from infection in the second wave, et cetera, et cetera. Lot of questions, right? Lot of good questions. In fact, these questions were so good that I didn't really have to think very much. I knew the answers. I just wrote a paragraph answering each of these questions and put it into the paper, okay? Um, many, many comments on the methods. That's the approach. The results section, can you talk about something else? You know, Can you refer to some other work, uh, et cetera? This is the first reviewer. The second reviewer sent their review in, on, in a different format, so I'm not showing it to you. Uh, third reviewer said some nice things, which is good, right? Suggested some re references. You need to talk about a couple of other things. And then the fourth uh, referee also made some suggestions, okay? So these were the referee reports, six pages of, from these three reviewers plus another few pages. Now let me show you my responses, okay? So can you see the, res do you see a document that says response to reviewers reports? Is that the one that's visible to you now, Pafirman? Are you seeing the responses? Yes, correct. Dr. Okay, good. So now look at this document. This is a 15 page document, all right? Um, and here, here are how I do the responses. This is just how I do it. You might have a different way. So here's my response. This is what the reviewer wrote. This is my response, okay? You summarize the paper well, this is exactly what I'm trying to say, thank you, okay? However, there are some problems with the paper. My response, I'm gonna address them, right? Literature review, this section lacks a general introduction. My response with an arrow, I've included a general introduction, right? Answering all your questions. And then briefly, I answered the questions here as well. I said, there were multiple waves, blah, 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 all these other things, okay? Another comment? another response, okay? So, um, uh, and then finally, the third document, I, I submitted this back to the journal and this is what they sent back. This was basically a one page review, right? Uh, reviewer B says, okay, reviewer C says, they've basically fixed everything. The editors say, you know, we welcome the careful attention the author has paid to the reviewer's comments, all right? Um, so you paid careful attention, we appreciate it. This is very, very important. And now do some basic formatting type stuff and then send us back your paper and we'll basically, we'll publish the paper, okay? So that is kind of a blow by blow account of the review process uh, that um, that paper went through, okay? Uh, these materials, by the way, I think AFIS will make available to you, these three documents. Feel free to take a look at them. Uh, this is how I do it. Again, you, you have a different personality and a different style. Just keep in mind the points I made. I think these things will increase the likelihood that your paper will get published, all right? If you have a chance to revise and resubmit your paper. Okay, let's move on. Choosing the right journal. Okay, we have about, we have about 20 minutes, good. So um, when I choose a journal, I use two criteria. One is the fit. In other words, does my research fit what the journal publishes? 
if the journal publishes things like my paper, chances are the editor believes that readers of his journal will read my paper. Okay. Remember, you want to place your paper in a journal where you think there'll be a lot of readers because that will motivate the editor to make an effort to help you clean up your paper and publish it. Okay. So look for the fit of the journal and look for the quality, right? There are thousands of journals out there. Some of them are considered to be better for whatever reason than others. And you want to make sure, you know, being an academic and being in research, part of it is about building your reputation as being knowledgeable about a subject, right? If you are able to place your papers in high quality journals, you will be more likely to more rapidly build your reputation as an expert in your field. Okay, so fit. Are my paper and the journal a good fit for each other? This is a question you should be asking when you're looking at a journal. Okay, you want to look at the subject matter of the journal and your paper and compare them. Uh, one way to do this is to check the journal web page. Go to the web page of the journal, see if the journal is broadly focused or narrowly focused. Does it want theory? Does it want some actual real world data? Does it have a geographical focus? Okay and then compare it with your paper, right? Um, does the subject of your paper fit within the substantive focus of the journal? Is it an empirical paper or a theoretical paper? Does it focus on a particular geography, all right? Another way to see whether there's a fit with the journal is to look at the references in your own paper. You wrote the paper, you've, you've cited work, see if the citations in your paper, right? Some of them are from that journal. If they are, chances are that the readers of the journal will also be interested in reading your paper, right? That's one way to make the connection. This is not a necessary thing, by the way. It's just one of many, many ways to figure out whether your paper is a good fit for the journal and vice versa, okay? A third issue, and, and this becomes more important, I think, maybe as you get more senior, I don't know. Um, with whom do you want to have a conversation? Your paper is not just a static piece of, you know, black and white sitting out there. It is also a conversation, right? You are citing other people's work. Other people will cite your work. They will engage with your paper, right? And so who are these people that you have cited? Who are the people that you want to cite your work that you want to have a conversation with, okay? And are those people the kinds of people who will read this journal? Have they published in this journal? That's one very good way to find out whether those are the people, all right? So keep this in mind. Who do you want to talk to and who do you want to listen to? And then finally, look at the culture of the journal. Actually look at some papers from the journal, see how they are written. Are they qualitative? Are they quantitative? Do they have a disciplinary emphasis? Is it mostly economics or is it political science or is it anthropology? Do they have an ideological emphasis? Are they leftists? Are they into the free market economy, right? These are all things you should look at in considering whether your paper fits a particular journal. Okay, second, is the journal a high quality journal, okay? And this is a very difficult thing to assess because there are many different ways to think about quality of a journal, all right? One of the first things I do when I'm thinking about the quality of the journal is I ask my friends, my colleagues in the profession. So you all are part of a research community. You all have professors, friends, colleagues, you know, um, who surround you wherever you are. Ask them, what do you think of this journal? Okay. What are some of the questions that I ask? Is the journal efficient? When I submit my paper, am I going to get a referee report within the next month or two? Okay. If it takes longer than that, I'm not wasting my time. All right. I want to get this paper published. I have a career to make. I can't sit around forever twiddling my thumbs while the journal tries to figure out what to do with my paper, all right? Uh, very recently, I submitted a paper. It sat around with the journal for a couple of months. I wrote them an email. I said, hey, what's happening with my paper? I didn't get a very good response. I got some random response. Yeah, we are looking, blah, blah, blah. I just told them I'm retracting my paper. I'm withdrawing my paper because I'm going to send it somewhere else, all right? So, you know, um, don't, don't let journals take too much time to get your paper out there for review because ultimately you are the person who will bear the cost, okay? 
you need to publish, you need to get your work out there, and you need to move on to the next research project. A second thing you want to think, okay, so is it efficient? Is the journal prestigious? Ask them, hey, which, which five or six journals are the best journals in this field, right? They'll tell you which ones they think are the best. Uh, does it use double blind review? This is often a marker of quality, right? Why? Because when, when a review is double blind, it means, that, and, and I think Dr. Kratoska mentioned this on Monday, it means that the reviewer does not know who you are and you do not know who the reviewer is. So you're going to get some very honest feedback and you're going to get feedback that focuses not on who you are, whether you are some well-known person in the field or starting out in your career. The focus will be much more heavily on the ideas in your paper. That's the most important thing about a double-blind uh, uh, journal, okay? Whatever feedback you get is going to be focused on the ideas and not on who you are. And then you can ask your research community, does this journal give thoughtful reviews? You know, when, I, when you've sent papers then you've got reviews, did you get anything out of the referee report? Did it give you feedback so that you could clean up your paper and make it better, whether it was rejected or not, okay? Um, some other criteria for reputation, selectivity. What percentage of the papers that the journal receives end up being published, okay? Typically, the highest quality journals publish less than, fewer than 10% of the papers they receive. My sense is, if you publish in a journal that, um, that publishes perhaps a quarter or fewer of the articles that it receives, you're probably dealing with a very high quality journal, okay? So if it has a, a, an acceptance rate of 25% or less, you're probably looking at a, a really, really good journal in the field, okay? So that's something to think about. A second is metrics like impact factor, Google Scholar rankings, the social science, sci uh, the social science citation index has um, uh, some measures, uh, Simago journal, uh, rankings. Also, you can go online and look at that. Dr. Kratoska mentioned this. These are all other metrics. So take a look at all of them. You know, there are many different ways of thinking about quality of a journal. Put them all together in your mind and probably a few journals will pop out that seem to do well on some, if not all of these metrics. Those are the ones that you want to get published in. Okay. And then finally, ask scholars. Uh, I mentioned this before. Ask them which are the top journals in the field. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, I already talked about this. So um, uh, I think I'll stop there because we are down to uh, 13 minutes. We do need a little time for Q&A. Uh, but these are the three topics that I wanted to get out. Uh, you know, the whole referee process, how to respond to referee reports, uh, how to select a journal. Uh, and um, I think now let's take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Siddharth, for a very intriguing uh, discussion. It was very, very helpful. Um, okay, once again, I would like to remind all of the audience, if you have any questions, please put it on the Q&A box so I can help read it out to our um, facilitator for tonight. Okay, let me see. Okay, I think I have one question here, Mr. Tidar. So um, do you have any tips as to how to keep our paper broad in terms of the readership scope while also being specific in terms of the content at the same time? Um, I think there's a trade-off. Uh, up to a point, there's a trade-off, right? Um, so the way... The way I approach the research that I write typically is I start with a question that's relatively narrow, right? Um, I have an idea that there are a lot of people who are interested in the subject. They are writing on this subject, right? And I try to imagine them when I'm writing the paper, right? Um, I, uh, you know, I usually cite a lot of work that they have written, um, people from that community, uh, because I want to engage with them, I'm having a conversation with them. So I usually start narrow. I have some very well-defined questions. I have the data that I need to answer the questions and I answer them and I write the conclusion of the paper. 
So the first draft of the paper is usually very narrow, okay? Um, and then once that's written, that's sort of the core of the paper. Then we can think, then you can step back and say, okay, I've, I've basically targeted the core audience. And now what are some of the broader implications of this paper, okay? So let's say I'm talking about the 1918 influenza pandemic in Indonesia. Let's look at Indonesia. Let's look at Indonesian data. Let's see what happened in Indonesia, okay? And once I've done that, I can step back and say, okay, what are some of the broader literatures with which this connects? What are some of the broader questions in the literature that this paper now answers, okay? And so the second writing of the paper usually uh, reaches out to a broader audience based on what was in the core of the paper. That's, uh, that's probably the best I can do. Um, you wanna make sure that there is a community with which you can have a conversation. That's the first step, okay? And for that, you need to look at, you know, all the books, everything that's been written in the subject. You want to make sure that there are people who will actually be interested in having that conversation with you. That's your core readership. So I think about it as a core readership and a peripheral readership. And I always start by writing for the core readership. And then in the second or third versions of the paper, I add aspects to the paper that might appeal to a, a more peripheral readership. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sidar. I have another question here. Okay, hold on. So this is a question from Nurliana from Universitas Bunda Mulia, Jakarta. How long should we wait for the reviewing process? Let's say we have been waiting for about six months, but there is no response yet from the reviewers. So what should we do? Should we just wait or is it okay for us to ask the reviewers or editors of the journals? So, um... So first of all, this, this depends on the subject and the type of journal you're submitting to, okay? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I've done some work on drugs and drug policy, right? There is a journal called Drug and Alcohol Dependence, which is one of the top journals in the field. And I've published a few papers there. I've also been asked to review papers for them. And the first time they sent me a paper to review, they told me, here's the paper. You decide if you want to review it. And I clicked, yeah, I want to review it because the question seemed an interesting one. And as soon as I clicked that accept button to review the paper, I got a message from the journal saying, send us your review within two weeks. Okay. So for the journal drug and alcohol dependence, I know that once I submit a paper there, it may take a week, maybe a week and a half for the editor to process the paper and send it to reviewers. But once it's out with reviewers, I know the editor is going to get reviews back in two weeks, maybe three weeks at the most, okay? So what that means is about a month to a month and a half after submitting the paper, I have a pretty decent idea that the editor has got the reviews back, okay? So with the journal Drug and Alcohol Dependence, a month and a half after submitting my paper, if I haven't heard from the journal, I email the editor and say, what's happening, okay? Obviously, I don't say what's happening. I write it more politely. I say, dear professor or dear doctor, so-and-so, you know, uh, this is in reference to a paper I submitted. I'm writing to ask if you might have some news on it. Please let me know, okay? Now, more generally, I think it is completely fair about a month to six weeks after you submit a paper to write an email to the editor saying, asking very politely, could you please let me know the status of my paper, okay? Um, but under no circumstances, I'm sorry to say, should you wait for six months, you know? You should send a reminder at most two months after you submit the paper. If you hit two months and you haven't heard from the journal, you need to get a reply from the journal, okay? You have a career, you need to publish, you cannot let this happen to you. All right. And as I said before, a reasonably prestigious journal in Southeast Asian studies, I pulled a paper from there because they would they had no news for me two months after I submitted it. You know, not even this is out for review. I just say, okay, you know, that's fine. I won't publish it. I'll move somewhere else. There are probably other journals that'll publish my work. Which they were, right? So other good journals ended up publishing the work. Okay. 
know, whatever. You run the journal better, you know, maybe, maybe I'll publish my stuff there. <laughs> okay, yes, I couldn't agree more with that, <laughs> Dr. Sidal. Um, okay, so the next question um, still revolves around um, the notification from the journal. So we have Yuni from Stikom Jakarta. Um, she said, um, I had an experience being rejected by an international journal, but there is no, but there was no explanation about what was wrong with my Jakarta article. So is it okay for me to ask the editor about the reason of the rejection? Um, so I, I, I'd like some clarification here, Yuni. Uh, did you get a desk reject? So how soon after you submitted the paper did you get a rejection? Was it very soon after or was it after a few months? Okay, I think while we're waiting for uni, yeah. can we maybe uh, do both scenario, Mr. Sidor? Yeah, why don't, why don't I answer both? Yeah. <laughs> so, there are prob you you got the rejection in on you know from one of two sort of directions right your paper may have been a desk reject so the editor may just have looked at the abstract looked at the paper and said not a good fit for my journal or i just don't think it has the you know the quality of approach or whatever it is we look for in our journal so i i i don't think i don't think that this is going to make it through the review process right that's a desk reject. Usually a desk reject will come back pretty quickly, okay? Um, about two months ago, I sent a paper to a journal and three days later, I got a desk reject, okay? That was great. I said, this is fantastic. You didn't waste my time, you know? I can now move on to another journal that hopefully won't desk reject the paper, okay? The reason the paper was desk rejected was the editor felt that it was not a good fit for the journal. I was looking at a country outside the United States. This journal focuses very heavily on the United States. So presumably their readers are interested in America and not so interested in other countries, right? And so he probably felt this was not a good fit for the readership. Um, so if you got a very quick reject, chances are either it was not a good fit for the journal or there was some serious issues with the quality of the paper. If the editor sent it out for review, he should have sent you some referee reports with it, with the paper when he sent it back, okay? And if you did not get any referee reports, chances are what you got was a desk reject, right? Now, let me just say one other thing. Um, one of the most valuable resources that a journal editor has is his referees, okay? These are usually volunteers. As I said, they're very, very busy people, okay? So editors have to be very careful how many papers they send out for review, right? If an editor sends me five papers to review in a year, chances are I'm going to decline at least the last three and maybe the last four. I may review one or two papers for each journal that, that I'm interested in every year, right? I'm not going to review five. So editors have to ration what they send out for review. And that's the reason why they often have lots of desk rejects. It's, you know what? This paper is not even close to what I would want to publish in this journal. So I don't want to burn down my credit or my goodwill with my reviewers by asking them to review it. Okay. And that's, you know, absent information about whether your paper was desk rejected or got a review and then reject. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm unable to respond. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sidar. So I have round one, two, um, two questions here on the system. The next one uh, would be from Azam from University of Groningen. How do you know that a journal publishes a quarter of papers it received? Some journals publish this information, okay? Um, so I think the Journal of Asian Studies, one time I went there and I think they said something like eight or 9% of the papers that they receive end up being published. That's under 10%. To me, that's a very good sign, okay? That's a journal I want to publish in. Some papers do not reveal that information, okay? And uh, if you don't find it on the web page, um, there's a good chance they don't reveal that information. So, so I guess it's a simple answer. 
Either they're going to tell you on their website or through some public forum, or they are not. But there are certain other measures that are widely available, like impact factor, Simago journal ranking, various metrics. Uh, those are things you can look at. But you know that should not be the only set of indicators that you use. It's very important that you talk to scholars in the profession, because there are some journals that are not part of these indices. So the journal Indonesia is considered to be a good journal for Indonesian studies. It's not part of all this impact impact factor business. But I think a lot of us who publish on Indonesia, we consider it to be a great place to, to place some of our research. So ask your colleagues as well. Okay, so um, I think this is the last question that I have. It's actually a long question, but I'm just gonna go on the second half of it. Um, okay, so what is your opinion about the I'm oh, sorry. So what is the uh, what is your opinion about the industry or publisher who ask big money for open access journal? Um, my personal opinion is that it will probably be easier for you to publish your paper in that journal, right? And and you know there is a conflict of interest problem because the journal, you know, a lot of these open access journals are online. So they have unlimited space, right? They can publish a thousand articles if they want to, right? They also have an incentive to accept your article because they only charge you the article processing fee after they accept your article, okay? I've heard the term pay to play used to describe these journals. So these are pay to play journals. Um, so, you know, I've published maybe two papers in these pay to play journals. And I might continue to publish every now and then, but if I were you, I would not publish all of my research in pay to play journals. You know, publish a few, fine. Uh, look at the impact factor, look at, you know, other indicators, other metrics. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you one example of an article that I published. Actually, I've published three papers in pay to play journals that I think was actually a very good decision. Um, so for the past 10 years, I've been writing on the 1918 influenza pandemic, right? And as you know, we are going through a global pandemic now, and a lot of people are looking at that kind of research, right? Now, most of my research is focused on Asia. I've done work on India, on Indonesia, on Sri Lanka, on countries in, in the, the so-called developing world, right? Now, the problem with writing papers on India and Indonesia is universities in India and Indonesia find it very expensive to subscribe to some of these journals. And they don't subscribe to these journals, right? The, the traditional journals. So if you publish your papers in those journals, the Indonesian and Indian readers are not gonna have access to those papers. And those are often the people you wanna be having a conversation with. It's like, what happened in your country, right? So I, and this was a complete accident about, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I published uh, two papers. Uh, I'll actually show this to you. It, it, you know, it just worked out that way. Um, I published two papers on the 1918 influenza pandemic. Just a moment. Uh, let's see. Let's just pop open Google. I'm going to search it up. So, yeah, let me share this with you. So I published this paper. It's on the 1918 influenza pandemic in India. I published it in 2014. And I happened to publish it in a pay to play journal, BMC Infectious Diseases. It's, a, it's an okay journal. It has an impact factor of 2.9 or something like that, which is, which is okay. It's not as high as it could be. But look what happened. When the pandemic happened, when the, when the COVID-19 pandemic happened and it went into India, all of a sudden, there was a lot of interest in the paper. If you take a look at these highlighted metrics, okay, 15,000 accesses, okay, probably a lot of them coming from India. Alt metric, I don't know if you know about this metric. I think Dr. Kratoska mentioned it. It got an alt metric score of 719, which is a very, very high alt metric score, all right? And the reason if you go to the metrics page, you can actually look at the metrics of these papers. Why? A lot of tweeting, you know, a lot of activity on Twitter and other places. 
But if you look at the map, why did it, where did it get all that attention? It got all of that attention in India, right? And the reason it was able to get attention in India is it was an open access paper, okay? If this had been a paper in a paywall journal, it would not have reached thousands and thousands of people in India. It would not have been tweeted. It would not have got whatever attention it got. So, so keep in mind that um, sometimes publishing in, in a pay-to-play journal can actually be, be very advantageous. If you want to, depending on the conversation you want to have and who you're having the conversation with. Okay, thank you, Dr. Siddharth. So I actually have several more questions, but I think we are running out of time. Do you still want to continue or? Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask both Paul, uh, Mr. Paul and also Mr. Siddharth here. I think, I, I think we should move on to Dr. Kratoska's uh, 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 question, uh, his presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, you know, we can hang on to these questions. I'll be around. I'm going to mute and shut off my video but okay. I will be around and uh, we can always come back to them if there's time remaining, yeah? Thank okay. You. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth, for your time once again uh, for a very fruitful discussion. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we will continue our session for today with our second speaker, which is gonna be Mr. Paul Kratoska. Dr. Paul Kratoska, the floor is yours. Okay, let's see if we can make this work Okay. the first time around. What are you seeing? Okay, this is the first slide. Perfect. Okay, then we're in good shape for a change. So what I'm talking about today is why your dissertation is not a book. And the thing about dissertations is that they sort of look like books. I mean, you take the size of it, the shape of it, it looks like it could be a book manuscript. The simple point is they are not books. And most of them do not become books. And honestly, most of them should not become books. Fundamentally, a book is a major contribution to knowledge. And a dissertation is an advanced student paper. So just to be sure that the slides are moving along, are they on, on your screen? Yes, just a couple. Okay, fair enough, okay. So, a book or a, a monograph is probably a better word if we're talking about academic writing, is what people call a long form argument, where a journal article is a short form argument. Very few dissertations contain long form arguments. Dissertations are designed to do certain things. And one of the things is not developing an argument that runs through all the chapters. They demonstrate the mastery of the writer over these things, the literature on the subject, the theoretical background of the theoretical literature, and then the ability of the writer to do research and to write up some research findings. Now, this is all something that you need in order to write a book, but the exercise itself doesn't make up a book. What these things are is training exercises. They're, they're sort of like a final exam as you're going through your PhD program. And honestly, no one wants to read these things. Back when I started up with NUS Press, I had a dissertation that somebody had sent me and I thought, well, it, it actually looks pretty good. So why don't I send it off to a referee and see if I can at least get some kind of preliminary response. So I did that and the referee refused to read it, sent me a rather nasty note and said, you sent me a dissertation? I'm not gonna waste my time on this thing. So he hadn't even paid any attention to whether it was a good piece of writing or not because it was simply a dissertation. So books are handling large issues and they're answering big questions. So let's just take a, a kind of a simple example. Uh, everything starts with a fact. So supposing you're playing around with this fact that on the national level of whatever country you wanna talk about, politics have shifted to the right. And the question might be, why is this happening? Well, to answer that question, you're going to have to cover a lot of material. Uh, 
just off the top of my head that you might want to look at the national economy, the education system, leadership, social media, and probably quite a few more things. Your PhD research would not qualify you to talk about all those things. Uh, the, the very strong likelihood is that it would qualify you to talk about one of those things. Uh, but that doesn't mean you could write a book on the topic. Articles will handle smaller topics. And so as an example, in the village I studied, politics is shifting to the right. Or maybe you would be wanting to say something about social media, okay? The rural population in the country is gaining more access to social media. Or maybe it's got to do with transport communications. Better transport has integrated the village into the national economy. Now this sort of thing, would be manageable in the space of an article. And it would these topics would not be suitable for books. So one of the things you want to think about is if you're trying to write a book, do you have a topic? Do you have a question and an argument that is or are big enough to make a book? Now for the presentation today, I've borrowed some comparisons that I found in a book by William Germano. Uh, this is quite a famous book um, from the University of Chicago Press called From Dissertation to Book. Uh, it's advice for how to go about converting a dissertation into a book. And I can also recommend a second one, a woman named Beth Louie, Publishing Your Dissertation, Advice from Leading Editors. However, having said that, the point of my talk today is to tell you probably you do not want to try and publish a book from your dissertation. So let's proceed. With a dissertation, you're fulfilling an academic requirement. With a book, you need to have a desire to be writing and speaking to a very wide audience. And one of the problems here is when you're picking a topic for a dissertation, you're looking for something that is manageable and you're looking for something that has not been researched heavily before. So an ideal topic is actually something fairly small, something that maybe nobody has, has done research on, but that you can use it to demonstrate your skills. You can go into this topic, um, you, can, you can get information together, you can develop an argument uh, and nobody has done it before, so it, it makes a very good dissertation topic. It doesn't make a good book. Because these books, are going, a book is going to require a very large amount of information and the likelihood that you can do something uh, with a small focused topic that will become the basis of a book is very small. Most dissertations have enough fresh material to write two or maybe three articles. But most dissertations do not have enough information or the right kind of material to write a book. So then there's the audience. Just a minute, see if I can move this out of the way there. The audience. So the audience for your dissertation is your PhD committee. And for a book, the book is going to go out into the world. It's going to have a life of its own. And the people who will read it, most of them will not know you. And you hope anyway that it will come to several thousand people. And, and let's be realistic about this. Uh, everyone has seen these airport books that have sold 50 million copies. Uh, if you get a book, your book is not going to sell 50 million copies. You'll be doing well if you sell 500. <clears throat> so who's the audience for your dissertation? Well, fundamentally it's your committee plus an external examiner. Uh, and your committee consists of professors who've worked with you on your research and on your writing. And they really want you to succeed. So they will have a sympathetic reading of what you've done. Uh, outside of that, it's not very likely that very many people are going to read your dissertation. Uh, you might hope that your parents would, but my parents never read mine, and I suspect that's true of most people. 
But a book is written for people interested in the subject of your research, plus a publisher, and the publisher simply wants a manuscript that people are going to read, and plus a group of readers. And those readers, in many cases, are coming to the book just because they want to learn something. Uh, and that's not because they want to see what you have accomplished. Uh, the fact that you have acquired these skills, that you have done this research. They want to know the product of your research, the outcomes. Okay, dealing with the literature. A dissertation is about reviewing existing scholarship, where a book is about building on existing scholarship. Dissertations very often contain long literature reviews. And the reason for that is that the writers have to show that they have mastered the relevant scholarship. And that's fine for a dissertation. Publications though, and this applies to both articles and monographs, actually do not require literature reviews at all. <clears throat> what they do require is some review of relevant ideas. The ideas, sorry, just <clears throat> So they, re they require a review of the ideas that other people have used that will contribute to your own research, your own work. And so the literature review comes in in the sense that you mention an idea. You say, here's something that people, other people have worked on. Then you can give a footnote and you say, these are the people, the key people who have talked about it. And, and it could be that 50 people have talked about one of these ideas, you do not want to put 50 sources in either to your book or your article. You've just put in a few of the key sources. And articles, again, they have to be positioned with respect to past work, but that doesn't mean that you want to do a comprehensive bibliography. If you try and do that, it, it really shows that you don't really quite know what you're doing in writing the manuscript. So don't carry over from the dissertation the idea that you have to review all the relevant literature. Okay, then there's the matter of quotations. And in a dissertation, people often use a lot of quotations and they'll quote from uh, books that they've read. Uh, this author says this and that author says that. But in writing a book, authors usually use very few quotations. And there's some reasons for that. One of them is that a quotation from a secondary source, if you do a lot of that, it suggests that you don't understand this material well enough to put these ideas into your own words. And secondly, if you're extensively quoting from a secondary source, this can create issues of copyright. So publishers, if they look at a book manuscript and they find that it's just very heavy with sources. Uh, there's one thing that they will be happy about, and that is somebody may have a lot of quotations from primary sources. Say if somebody's done archival research, because what was said by say a colonial official in 1870 can display a lot about the attitudes and the ideas of the time. And that can be just fine. But if it's a lot of quotes from other authors. Uh, in your book, you need to be presenting your own views, your own, own research in your own words. Then there's a question of the author's voice. Now, what is the author's voice? It's really the writing style of, a, of an author. And a dissertation, it tends to hide the author's voice. Or in fact, many dissertation writers haven't developed a voice. But a book brings out the author's voice. See, so PhD students, you've been writing student essays. And a lot of student essays consist of going into other people's work, drawing out ideas and summarizing those ideas. And that's even true to some extent in a PhD dissertation. So you don't have much of an opportunity to, to figure out, okay, if, if I'm writing a book and I've collected a lot of details, how am I going to present this? 
So your voice is essentially how you present information. It can be how you structure your sentences. Do you write short sentences or long sentences? Um, it can be the word choice. Do you use uh, big words or simple words? Uh, do you adopt a certain tone, uh, a certain point of view? And all of these things taken together uh, are what we mean when we talk about an author's voice. So again, with a dissertation, this doesn't really figure. Uh, but in a book, the author's voice is often distinctive. When I started off, I mean, when I was just going into graduate school, and I took an examination which was designed for prospective historians. And my background actually wasn't in history up until that point. And this was a terrible exam for me. But one of the questions was, or several of the questions actually, they would say, which historian is likely to have written the following passage? And then they would, they would give a passage and then they would give four names. Now, in my case, I hadn't really heard of several of these people, but for somebody who had read extensively in history, uh, there would be the subject matter, but there would also just be the way the writing was done. And these would be, would be clues that somebody who had done a lot of reading in this, in this area would pick up on and they would be able to identify who the scholar was. So in a dissertation, the voice is hidden. Uh, mostly people present information in a very neutral way. Uh, and they present it for the most part as if they are the omniscient narrator. In other words, there's somebody who's standing outside of what's going on, looking down on it and recording it. Uh, now, this is not always true with anthropologists because often they're writing as participant observers, but in many other disciplines, uh, this is the general approach. So if you're writing a book, what an author, what you would need to do, or what authors need to do, was to consider the perspective you're adopting. And to give you some examples about that, historians traditionally were just standing outside and looking down on things. And then a few years ago, well, I guess a few decades ago now, uh, people started writing what they called subaltern studies. And this was really looking from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And so that's a shift of perspective. Uh, today, there's a lot of attention to gender. And again, looking at events from a gendered perspective is something different. So if you can come up with a perspective uh, that is useful, uh, you might say, okay, we're going to start with a, a family and this family does these things or is in these circumstances. Now I'm going to expand that to uh, a village, to a state, to a country. And so there, there are different ways you can tackle presenting your material. Uh, so all of that would feed into the perspective. Uh, you need to think about what, what the voice you're going to use is because you control this. Uh, I said it is something that pe people um, adopt a certain choice of words and so on. And that's exactly what I mean by this as a choice. You, you pick the words that go in. Uh, you decide, am I going to try and make this a long sentence or am I going to write a lot of short and simple sentences? And finally, what you need to be doing, you take control of the material and you speak about it with authority. At least in my experience, what I tend to do when I'm writing something, I've got factual material and I'm just recording what that material says. And so this happened, this happened, this happened and so on. But at some point, if I'm going to make this article really work, I step back from it. And I essentially ask the question, what's going on here? What is the data telling me? And at that point, I position that data as the answer to a question, as the support for an argument that I'm making. Okay, examples and case studies. Dissertations tend to have a lot of examples and they tend also to be repetitive. 
uh, where a book will be more selective in giving these examples. So multiple case studies that are making the same point reinforce that point, but they also serve to demonstrate the research skills a student has developed. And in a dissertation, that works out all right. But books are using these examples to illustrate for the most part, rather than persuade. There are exceptions to that, but a lot of these, uh, a lot of cases, it's just simply to say, I've made this point this, here's an example of this point. Uh, I have others, and trust me that I do have them and that they make the same point, uh, but I'm not going to fill the book up with all these examples. Then there's something, I guess we'll call it the goal of the manuscript. And a dissertation that is showing off your skills, your analytic skills, whereas the book is really about developing a core idea. And so the books are using those analytic skills to explain the content and that they are structured to present a story. And books and articles also need to be built around a core idea. And that core idea is what connects all the information that you're going to present. So I suppose you could think of it well, maybe like a backbone and ribs attached to it. So the backbone is the, the core idea and it runs right from the beginning to the end. But along the way, you bring in the ribs, the, you bring in these things, that information that you connect to that core idea. So the core idea lies at the heart of the narrative that you write. And the information that you put into the manuscript should, I'd maybe say must, be related to that core idea. So let's just take a simple example here. Supposing you're writing a book called The Indonesian Diet. Now, that book might deal with a number of things like nutrition, it might deal with trade, the import of foodstuffs, the growing of foodstuffs, uh, with health issues, and you could go make that list a lot longer. Now, each one of those items could be the topic of a book or perhaps an article. But if you're writing a book called The Indonesian Diet, the story you're telling is what people in Indonesia eat. And so if you're talking about trade, it's in connection with telling the story about what people eat. Oops, hang on, sorry, I've gotten lost here. Now, on the other hand, let's say you were writing a book about trade in Indonesia. Well, in that book, the focus would be trade. Now, you might include information about food imports. Uh, you might even have reason to talk a bit about nutrition. Uh, if somebody is concerned about nutrition and saying, okay, we need to buy more food from outside or similarly about health, but you wouldn't tell a big story about uh, food imports, nutrition, or health, because your topic here is trade. So everything that you say about these other issues should relate to trade. Okay, so I've been trying to be discouraging about turning your dissertation into a book. However, if you still want to do this, if you still want to turn your dissertation into a book, then consider these things. First of all, reputable publishers will almost never review an unrevised dissertation. So don't even bother approaching a publisher and say, would you like to read my dissertation? If you are going to try and turn your dissertation into a book, uh, you need to rethink the material, rethink the audience, and basically write a different manuscript. Now you might go to a conference somewhere and there'll be publishers there who are looking for manuscripts. And it's perfectly all right if there's an acquisitions editor to say, could I talk to you a bit? I'm, here's my idea for what I'm going to do. And 
would you be interested in a book on this topic? And sure, it's fine if it comes out of your dissertation, but just bear in mind that the acquisitions editor is not going to want to see your dissertation. Now, there's a few more problems about dissertations. One of them is they're online and they're free to read. So libraries don't want to buy books based on dissertations. So here's a key bit of advice. If, if you have turned your dissertation into a book, you should not have anything in it that suggests that this was a dissertation. Don't thank your supervisor. If, your, supervi if you, your supervisor has been a big help, you want to thank your supervisor, that's fine. You say thank you to professor so-and-so for helping, for reading the manuscript and helping me out. Just don't say that professor so-and-so was your supervisor. Because what happens, certainly in the US book market, libraries are buying books through commercial distributors. And they tell the distributor, okay, we're looking for books, say, in political science, and we're looking for books that focus on, let's say, the United States and Europe, and so on and so forth, and we don't want any dissertations. So what these distributors are going to do, the books come into them, and essentially they're putting them into baskets. Okay, here's a book. This fits the profile that we've been given by this university, so fine, they get this book. And so they're going to be looking for any indication that a book is a, a rewritten dissertation. And if they find it, that book is not going to go in the basket. It's going to go over in the corner and your book is dead. So be really careful about that. Uh, change the title too, because they can, they can obviously look up your dissertation and find out what your dissertation title was. And then do bear in mind that in many universities today, uh, articles published in first tier journals will actually do you more good than writing a book. If you're going to write an article drawing on your dissertation, you have to concentrate on what is new, what information in your dissertation is new. So first of all, your dissertation has a theory section. It's very unlikely that that says anything new. So forget about it, throw it out. You have a literature search. That's very unlikely that that says anything new. So get rid of that as well. You need to focus on your research findings. You might turn a chapter into an article that could also be a bit complicated because you've written this chapter as part of a larger work. So if you're going to turn it into an article, you will certainly have to start with a different uh, background. You'll have to introduce the topic differently and it will have to be a self-contained piece rather than part of a larger whole. Another thing you can do though, is you ask a new question. Uh, because in your, your dissertation, at the end of the day, you would have answered a certain set of questions. But the chances are very good that your material can be used to answer a different question. And after you've gone through this material, written the dissertation, uh, you should have a really good idea of what kind of question you could ask. And besides, by that time, you're probably pretty sick of the question you asked in the first place. So it'll be a healthier situation all around if you can come up with a new question. Another thing you can do, you will certainly have omitted some material from your dissertation. And sometimes the smart thing to do, because again, when you finish a dissertation, you're thoroughly sick of it. You don't want to see it again for a while. So look at the material that you didn't put in the dissertation and say, well, what can I do with that? Can I write an article based on that? Or you can do some more research. And this is often very wise because when, you've, when you do your first round of research for a dissertation, the chances are pretty good. You don't exactly know what you're doing. Uh, people generally go into that research process and they have the idea, I'm going to collect a lot of material on this topic, whatever the topic is. Uh, what you're going to do with it though at that stage is very unclear. 
And I can remember sitting in archives in London and, and saying, well, do I need this piece of information? Because it's gonna take me time and energy to copy it down. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it out. After you've done that and you come back home and you write your dissertation, you probably are going to realize that some of the material you didn't collect, you could actually use. And so as you do your, your writing, think about the questions you could answer, think about whether you have the material to answer them, think about what material you've seen as you did your research that you didn't pick up, but might be useful to get uh, for future work. And as always, build your article around an argument. So that is what I have to tell you today. <laughs> and that actually is the end of what I have to tell you because I've given you a series of talks over the past what, four days, and this is the last one. So thank you. You've, I assume you've been an excellent audience, even though I can't see you, <laughs> but thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Dr. Paul. Yes, I'm also sure of that. Um, everybody has been very enthusiastic um, about <laughs> this whole okay. um, workshop ser uh, series. Okay, so I have one question for you. Um, okay. Uh, the question comes from Tegar Satya Putra from Universitas Atmajaya, Yogyakarta. So he asks, do you have any tips for stating research limitation without discounting reader or reviewer perception about my research robustness? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, ask that again. Sorry. Okay. So do you have any tips for stating, um, stating research limitation without discounting reader or reviewer perception about um, the research robustness? Yeah, you don't think about that. Okay. Uh, what you want sorry, to think I'm sorry, about Mr. is... Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Paul. Uh, do you mind oh. to stop sharing your screen? <laughs> I think I thought I had. Okay, hang on a minute. No worries. Uh, no, I hadn't. You're right. There we go. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I don't think you should be thinking about that, uh, at, at least not when you're trying to start writing something. What you want to be thinking about is what question you're answering. And if you pick a question that you can answer, but there are certain points that, that you don't have, that's fine. You can you just say that's my limitation. But if, if you pick a question where that you have a lot of things, a lot of the answer that you'd like to give you don't have, you've picked the wrong question. So I don't think, I think you're kind of tackling this from the wrong end. Uh, start off by, by asking questions that you can answer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, okay, I'm still uh, encouraging for all of the audience, if you have any further questions, don't be afraid to ask the question and answer uh, feature on the webinar. Um, and while we're waiting, I have a question from the previous session. Uh, Pap, oh, Yunman, okay. may I also respond yes. to that question? So, oh, please, you know, Dr. Siddharth, yes. Different disciplines have different traditions, right? So in the health sciences, if you're writing a paper on public health or epidemiology, they actually expect to see a limitation section in which you talk about limitations. And the way I usually write those sections is I talk about the limitations honestly, but I also explain in that section why I do not think those limitations detract from the overall conclusions of the paper. One, one thing that's quite clear is that if you have a limitation and you hide it, that's likely to get you in trouble. Yeah. Be, be completely honest and open, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, if a referee, um, this is a good way to deal with referee reports. If the referee points out a limitation and there's nothing you can do about it, probably the best way to respond is to say, thank you very much. This is a limitation. I believe that the overall results of the paper still stand, but we are including, we are now mentioning this in a limitation section. Thank you. That's assuming that the overall results still do stand. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes somebody points out such a serious limitation that you're dead. But uh, yeah, that's right. I, I was assuming that you're actually going to respond to the referee. 
Yeah. If the overall conclusions don't stand, you're not going to write that response to the referee. You're going to basically say, yeah. I don't think I want to send this paper back. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Paul and Dr. Siddharth. Um, so the next questions that I have right here was actually aimed for Dr. Siddharth, but I'm, I'm sure that both of you could answer it. So the first question is, uh, as a reviewer yourself, what do you normally find is the most common major revisions that you suggest or propose to the author? For the kinds of papers that I review, um, usually it's in the approach section. And usually it is, you know, because I do quantitative research, it's because there are some variables that probably should have been included in the model that were not included or there are certain uh, flaws in the design of the analysis that need to be fixed. So the analysis needs to be conducted using some additional checks on whether the results are robust. Those are the most common ones that I find in, in the quantitative papers that I receive. Okay, thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Dr. Paul, do you have anything to add? Uh, not to that, no. Okay, <laughs> no worries. Um... Oh, okay, so I have a question for Dr. Paul here. Um, this is from Muzayin from Universitas Islam Indonesia. Um, in European style, we may do our PhD through two different ways, the article-based dissertation and also the monograph, which is usually published by the university, um, which, will, which will be having um, ESBN, right? Uh, so the monograph is not a book, question mark. <laughs> And then the second part of the question is, if our dissertation is already published and having the ESPN, then is it unethical to proceed further uh, the same draft for a book, for example, by adding the, da the data, expanding the perspective and doing more research? It yeah, I should, I should have said something about the European practice, uh, which I, I think it's, it's being it's under threat right now in some ways but there used to be a, a principle that it, you had to publish your dissertation and there were publishers that specialized in that kind of thing uh, it was done not very often at the expense of the writer and I, when i first came across this i, I was uh, just starting my graduate school uh, graduate program and uh, I remember picking up one of these things and somebody saw me with it and said, oh, that's just a published dissertation. You don't have to think too hard about that. So even though it was published uh, and it was a book after a fashion, uh, it's still, it's basically a dissertation. So that's, that's the first thing. What's happening now is that the open access movement in Europe uh, has also been considering what to do about dissertations. And especially in Germany, uh, there are a whole bunch of new university presses. And you think in this day and age, why would anyone start a university press? But these are open access presses. Uh, they have very low expenses and they're, they're often within the university. But one thing that they have worked out with the university system is that if somebody publishes an ebook through these university presses, it counts as a publication for purposes of getting the dissertation um, approved. So this is a kind of a changing terrain. Now, the other part of your question is, okay, if you've got your dissertation published that way, now what if you were to add in additional information, uh, statistics and what have you? Uh, I don't think I can answer that except to say that you can approach a publisher, but you have to be upfront about what the situation is. But as a rule, publishers are not going to want to publish a dissertation. That it, it, You probably are going to be told, well, we might be interested in this topic. Uh, we don't handle dissertations. So if you write us a book on this topic, uh, sure, we might take a look at it. Uh, Siddharth, do you want to chime in? <clears throat> Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm more in a journal article producing discipline, so I'll defer to you, uh, Paul, on the book side of things. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, I'll proceed to the next question. This is also for Mr. Paul. Um, so 
this one is actually part comment and also part questions. So I'm going to start with the comment first. So Azalia Mohran Shah from University um, of Buffalo, Buffalo. In my department, the common practice is to turn dissertations into books, which is why we write them in the format of books and have an embargo for one or two years. And many experts in my field, which is media, have also done so. So I think this is not uncommon, but I do agree that it needs a lot of work to transform dissertation into books. Okay, that's part of the comment. And okay. um, the, question, uh, the questions are, do you have any suggestions on how people usually approach editors to submit our book proposals? And then second one, are conferences still the, base, uh, the best place to meet them and do an initial introduction? Thank you. They're probably just about the only place that you can meet an acquisitions editor. Uh, and do bear in mind that, uh, well, at least for the Association for Asian Studies, uh, the major publishers in North America and some of the European ones, and actually some of the Asian ones, uh, will have display, book displays there. But you're not always certain who they've sent. And sometimes they sent marketing people, sometimes they sent an acquisitions editor. So if there's an acquisitions editor there, uh, it could be hard to get an appointment to see that person because they're, they're booked. So you can normally find out in advance if you're interested in a certain press as a possible publisher for your work. They may well have an announcement on their webpage saying we will be sending uh, one or two acquisition editors to these conferences in the course of the year. And if that's the case and you want to talk to one of them, you'd be smart to make an appointment in advance. Okay. Thank you. And, and as for approaching, okay, one of the things that is strongly discouraged is people writing to a publisher and saying, dear editor, now, uh, the big presses will have several editors and there'll be a page somewhere that says the fields that they work in. And so you ought to be able to figure out which editor, which acquisitions editor uh, is the right one for your work. And so the thing to do is to address a letter to that person by name. And the reason for doing that is that it shows that you've actually paid attention to this press. Uh, you're not just saying, okay, I'm going to pick this press out of thin air, but you've actually paid attention to the kind of thing they publish and who at that press works on that topic. Now, you might guess wrong, and, but if you approach it that way, whoever you send it to is, will, I think, be quite comfortable about saying, well, I'm not quite the right person, but I have passed it over to the person who is. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think I have question for Dr. Siddhar. Um, okay, so this is for, uh, from Tegar Satya Putra from Universitas Satpajaya, Yogyakarta. Um, regarding quantitative analysis or research, do you have any experience where the reviewers comment about omitted variable or endogeneity in your model? How do you address a comment, especially when you do not have the data about the stated omitted variable in the research model? Good question. Yeah, so this is a great question. In fact, this was a, this was kind of the response I gave you earlier, right? In fact, the two most common critiques I have in quantitative analysis are comments about endogeneity and omitted variables. Um, and to be honest, if you don't have a variable that somebody considers to be an omitted variable, you have to very seriously ask yourself whether this is whether your results um, are legitimate, right? Um, so, you know, if, if a variable is omitted and the data don't exist, that's just a problem. It's probably a problem you can't fix, okay. unfortunately. All right. So my, my, I, I guess if you can go collect data on that variable, you know, and add it to your model. <laughs> okay. With, with endogeneity, it's easier because there are, there are methods that you can use to address endogeneity in models, right? So that is a lot easier to, but omitted variables are omitted variables. <laughs> Either you have them or you don't. So. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think um, before I close our session for today, I think there's just one question that I think 
um, is quite interesting regarding the journal publication. So when journals cannot find suitable reviewers and authors are made to wait for months and even another months, um, does this signal journal quality? For example, that the editor really wants to make sure that uh, the paper will receive quality feedback or the opposite, that the journal isn't the right journal for the paper since they are having a hard time finding anyone relevant for the topic. So that's a good question. And my response would be, <clears throat> it almost doesn't matter. The point is your career trajectory is being held up and you need to think about a solution to that. And in this situation, if I were you, I would pull my paper and move on to another journal. I would, I would write to the journal one more time and say, look, you know, it's been two months, write it nicely, obviously. It's been two months and you know, could you let me know what's happening? And if you get a reply that is anything except your paper is out for review, I would pull the paper and move on. Don't waste your time with the journal. That's wasting your time. Well, it wouldn't be quite so harsh, but uh, the general point is right. Uh, but, it, but it really has to do with communication with the editor. And if the editor is, is in touch with you and explaining the situation, because what can happen there, there are two, three uh, excusable th problems. And one is that the editor has sent it out, uh, but the referee hasn't bothered to respond. Now, in that case, it, it, the editor will tell you it's, it's, it's out, but the editor may have to tell you, well, we're looking for another reviewer because there's been a problem with there. And you know, that to me would be a perfectly acceptable situation because the, the journalist is saying, yes, we're interested. So that's one, um, and there can it, it depends a little bit on the different on the on the paper, and I, I'm working on one paper right now that uh, it's set in Malaysia. It's it's a well written paper. It's perfectly relevant to the journal I edit, but it is so specialized that I'm, I'm thinking I probably don't want to do it because I don't think many people are going to read it either. Uh, so. Uh, but but I don't think this paper can be published anywhere else because it's so specialized. So partly as an author, you need to be thinking a bit about if, if I pull it from this journal, are there really other journals that are likely to be interested? So I'd be a bit cautious about that. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Paul, with both your comments. I think if the journal has made a good faith effort and it has invested its resources to advance the process, then it's, it's, it's probably not right to withdraw your paper because remember the editor is burning his goodwill or her goodwill with some reviewers just by sending them your paper to review, right? So if, they have, if they've already incurred that cost, then I would not withdraw the paper, um, uh, definitely. Okay, um, so Mr. Paul, I have one question if you don't mind, or do you want to... No, I, well, Is we have him? to we have to go on because we're having individual consultations soon. But sure, we do one more question. Why not? Okay, okay, one more question. So, um, if we want to publish our research into a book, is it better doing it through a university press or just regular non-university press publication? And what are the advantage and disadvantages in? Well, I'm not sure what a regular non-university press publication is, but uh, the thing to understand is that the commercial academic presses, they have, they publish their books at, at very high prices. And so if your book costs $200 a copy, uh, what they're going to do is publish a very small number of copies, probably 200 to 250. And those copies will be sold to libraries. Uh, individuals aren't going to be able to buy it, aren't going to want to buy it. Uh, you as an author probably will have trouble buying enough copies to give to the people that you owe copies to. Um, but uh, they, do, they do publish a lot. And as I said earlier on, if you do the calculations for the cost of a book, uh, okay, on the one hand, you, you multiply 200 copies by $200, you get quite a large sum of money. But these publishers, have very high overheads because they're large operations. They, they have worldwide distribution and so on. So they need to get a lot of money in. And that means that they, they try to publish a lot of books. 
The editorial review often is fairly limited. Uh, so there are some, some severe limitations. Uh, the university presses though, it's getting harder and harder because they are, they're, it's very much in demand to publish a book with the university press. And so we've talked about the success rate <clears throat> or the failure rate of manuscripts sent to the top journals. And so a top journal is probably going to reject more than 90% of the material sent to it. And I mean, you could say that, okay, 50% of it is hopeless. It's, it's gone to the wrong journal. It's just, there's no hope for 50% of it anyway. Uh, the rejection rate is still pretty high. If you look at the top university presses, and, and bear in mind that, so let's take North American presses. They're probably around 100. But most of those presses, if you're writing about Indonesia, they won't touch it. They have no interest. They don't have the readership for that. And they probably don't have much of a readership for anything outside of not just the United States, but the part of the United States where they're located. So the number of university presses in North America that might take a book on Indonesia is already pretty small. And most of them are big ones that have international operations. So, I mean, the standard names, uh, Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Chicago, California. Those presses are rejecting something like 98% of the proposals and manuscripts they receive. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul. Uh, Mr. Sierra, do you want to add anything before I close the session? I do journal articles, so I'm happy to defer <laughs> to Paul. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that marks, uh, that marks the end of our session for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, and also Dr. Siddharth for the elaborations. It was very, very fruitful. And uh, thank you also for all of the attendees for joining our, uh, on our fourth day of the workshop on academic writing for international publication presented by American Institute for Indonesian Studies, IFIS, and also National Research and Innovation Agency. And don't forget that we still have one more session as part of our workshop series, which will be held on Wednesday, June 16th, uh, 2021, starting at 6.30 p.m. Western Indonesia time, which will be presented by Dr. Yosef Jakababa. He will be discussing about presenting your paper or work in progress effect effectively at an international academic conference, um, which will then um, be followed by closing session for our workshop series. All right, with that being said, I once again, on behalf of the committee, would like to extend our gratitude to all of our distinguished speakers and attendees. I am Firman Lung. Um, have a great day and um, have a great evening, of course, and stay safe, everyone. See you on the 16th.